I have a I have a question. No, go ahead, Tori. You're, you're the first one, and Shishir gonna be after you. Okay, I just um, uh, see Henry. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, just just questions about um, what did Schopenhauer do? Was he a professor most of his life? And then number two. Did he have any friends <laughs> oh with, such, with such a pessimistic outlook? <laughs> I believe I believe he, he lectured in the university. I am not I am not familiar with the details of his life. In uh, actually, it's, uh, I, this is what I have to research. Uh, in terms of friends, honestly, I am not sure. I I don't know. I uh, his biography doesn't state any friends. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Mr. Shishir. And John Cummins after. Need to unmute Shishir. My best speech was wasted. I'll try again. Oh, go <laughs> Please repeat yourself. As, as always. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Okay, Henry, first of all, thank you very much for sharing Schopenhauer with us. Of course, when we talk about Schopenhauer and in answer to Tori's question about Schopenhauer's earlier life, born of a rich family, a rich father, father died very young, and he inherited money, went into academics reluctantly, did not care much for it. Um, his mother was not sympathetic to his pessimism. And he gained popularity much late in his life. He yes. was paranoid and he slept with a gun. Okay, that gives you an indication of the, of the psyche of the mind that we're thinking about. What so he was having, afraid of, she shared. What, what he's afraid of well, himself? That, <laughs> that he did not share with me, I'm afraid. Oh. Uh, the second part, uh, I'm going to highlight uh, his connection to the Eastern philosophy and as well as Greeks. Um, and in, uh, at, some, at some extent to Stoics, also he criticized Stoics. Um, well, so anyways, I was just going to finish off what I started with. Uh, in terms of what you brought to, to, to our attention, Henry, it's most in interesting that what Schopenhauer is talking about, and remember, this is the continental philosophers who just getting insight about the Eastern philosophy, Upanishads were something that he really read, Buddhism was something he was influenced by. And quite often, there's a negative implication that he was very pessimistic. And when you brought in the slides about death is the only answer to, to this life, of course, that kind of brings an edge to the, the pessimism indicated in Schopenhauer's philosophy. However, towards the later end of his life, he was much more optimistic, which I'm sure you're going to talk about. Uh, will, will that he talks about is it, really our need to survive. And our need to survive always precedes all our, the, our needs because we have that fear that behind every bush lurks a tiger. And as long as we got that mindset of self-protection, we somehow never clear our mind from the clouds of this fear. And the Buddhism philosophy, you know, is very similar in the sense that people kind of call it a pessimistic philosophy. But there again, it's a question of will will never be satisfied. You have to stop with the needs. And if you seek tranquility, which is where Schopenhauer goes towards in the end, you need to kind of sub or, or subdue some of that will that continuously sits and rides our backs. So I thought that was well brought out through your slides. The cognition, of course, is mere appearances, and Plato comes to mind as soon as you brought that into picture. What we comprehend is what our mind comprehends, is reality based upon our perception. That's really the question. Is reality real? Or is it different from each, each and every one of us? When I say, this bottle wins my heart, I'm an artistic philosopher. I'm speaking in metaphors, and that's really where he goes. With the, that's why I think he's represented as an artist, artist philosopher, because he thinks the right brain type, not left brain, not the empiricist 
thinking much more and the, the, the uh, continental thinking. So I, I think you brought those points well to, to our attention and I thank you for that, Andrew. Uh, what is interesting in the second part, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to this, but uh, uh, there is some uh, connection with the idea of uh, Brahman uh, comes to my mind because uh, Brahman is this unstoppable, uh, overpowering, uh, uh, over, uh, omnipresent, omnipresent force. However, yeah. Oh, well, I think uh, Brahman doesn't carry the uh, premise, the concept of negativism, because uh, the, the, this idea of negativism is pure human, and uh, Brahman is uh, does not does not include our personal interpretation of this force. If I can just answer that, Brahman is really talking that the life is an illusion. And what we consider to be pain and pleasure are no longer there because we are an illusion. And it's really something that we can only escape by finding those glimpses of tranquility, which come as the mind calms down and we catch little glimpses of it when we meditate. Good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shishir. Thank you, Henry. Uh, John Cummins, are you ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Henry. And uh, thanks for the presentation. And uh, I, I, I've been reading bits and pieces of Schopenhauer in his original text. And he's very funny, but he's a great writer. And I don't know why all this pessimism surrounds him. I mean, Montaigne said, as the philosopher said, in, in order to live properly, you have to learn to die and accept death. Schopenheimer did those things. People say that it was a great tragedy of some kind, that he called it will, because will has intention. He should have used the word energy. People have also said is that Schopenheimer, in words, figured out E equals MC squared 100 years before Einstein. And I think that's a fact if you read his writings. Yeah, yeah. Freud, he says he was 100 years ahead of Freud in terms of many of uh, Freud's great ideas. Others have said he's the greatest philosopher since Plato. So he's getting a bad rap, in my opinion. I think he's a great philosopher and should be read. And again, he didn't get any traction until about 100 years after his death where people really started to read him and understand him. He was a fan of Hinduism. He was a fan of, of Buddhism, the thinking man's religion. This guy was ahead of his time. He was courageous. He was a great philosopher, in my opinion. Now, Henry, when he said will, does will die? Does will is if it's energy, it never dies. It's just transformed. So I knew he felt will was destructive, as energy can be destructive. It wants to live on, right? I mean, the sun, the heat, it's destructive, but yet it gives it gives life. I think I'm, Schopenhauer understood that, and for whatever reason, um, it's. He's not being treated fairly in, in this regard, in my opinion. Uh, how do you feel, Henry? Uh, I, I agree, actually. The, this, this, his magnum opus, uh, the world as a will of presentation, was recognized only just before his death and then and afterwards. Uh, as well, uh, in my opinion, um, each philosopher, all philosophers are human beings. They cannot dispute that. And each philosopher, includes in, in his philosophy a part of his personality and probably a part of his personality in a certain stage of his life. So my understanding is Schopenhauer uh, has reflected in, in, in his work his uh, particular state of mind at that, at that stage of his life. Later on, uh, well, if, if you read, if he produced uh, a lot of work he produced a lot and then the, uh, it's not it's not all that pessimistic 
But in my understanding, he tried to convey the main idea of the world. Uh, I, don't, I don't see it as gloomy and pessimistic completely. Personally, I don't. I don't see it that way. Um, again, uh, it depends on the personal uh, interpretation and again, on, on, on our cognition, as he mentioned. Oh. Oh, well, thanks, Henry. That was a very good addition from John. Appreciate it, John, of course. Hi, Iggy, do you have any questions? I see your beautiful face. No? Are you unmuted? <laughs> uh, no, I haven't been listening long enough to... Uh, so I won't pester uh, Henry. Okay. <laughs> Still, thank you for a smile anyway. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Who else has any ideas? What is wrong? What is right? Mr. John Smithen, oh, yeah. you have the floor. Yeah, for some reason I couldn't do my yellow hand. I, I don't know why. <laughs> but okay. anyway, yeah, um, and we've got a couple okay. more. Um, yeah, I would be interested in sort of pursuing this uh, connection with, you know, Swadiza Eastern philosophies, you know, such as Hindu. Of course, then she and I have had this, you know, talk before, and she might want to sort of come in. They're not really Eastern in the sense of far Eastern. They're, they're, they're directly in the sort of Indo-European tradition, you know, so it makes it makes perfect sense that German idealism, you know, and, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, etc., would have, as it were, common roots. But, but what I found, in, uh, there are two points I want to make about the, uh, the about the Buddhism. Um, the first is exactly that one about the, the connections between German idealism and Philosophers from the subcontinent. Is it? Can I call them that, Shazia? Yeah, yeah. That that's the, as as opposed to quote Eastern, uh, uh, you know, uh, philosophy. Um, and it's this: uh, Schumpeter in in world in the world as one in representation certainly did make copious references to recently translated Sanskrit text. You know that that's all over but he claims to have actually worked out those ideas on his own independently, um, you know, way back with his doctoral thesis, I think. Um, you know, again, Shasir might have more, more information on that. So, so I, I find that an absolutely fascinating thing. Um, uh, um, and, uh, you know, I wonder if that's worth exploring more, you know, that level of connection. And I wonder if Shasir has, uh, so, so, some some views, uh, you know, on that. The second thing is um, the thinking man's religion. It's also a thinking woman's religion too, John Cummings, by the way. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, my, my, my daughter <laughs> happens to be, a, <laughs> some of you know her, my stepdaughter happens to be a, a Buddhist nun. But... Yeah, John, can I say something? Yeah, of course, please. <laughs> John, we live on a spectrum. There's an infinite number of entities that should be associated with a thinking spectrums religion. Uh, I, I agree. <laughs> I agree fully. Percent. But one of the debates that I have with, uh, with Yana or Annie Yeshi is precisely this pessimism. Again, the Buddhism is full of the world is suffering. Uh, you know, uh, with, we have to suffer and the, and the whole point of life or Buddhist practice is to somehow escape from suffering. And to be honest, um, I have great difficulty in uh, agreeing with that perspective. Uh, uh, John, John, yeah, 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 you know, I mean, where does, where does this notion of suffering come from? It, 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 it's, it's, in the, it's in the individual's own mind. So, so, so can I, I, I just want to um, raise those two points. One, the connection between the German idealism and philosophies of the subcontinent, if I can put it. And again, where comes this pessimism, you, you know, uh, from? Um, like, uh, um, I often say to Jana, you know, uh, my stepdaughter, don't forget, she and I have been through many tragedies and many problems together. 
but I I just find it difficult to to despair in that way. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Uh, um, so anyway, I, you you. you uh, you, you will take that up, Henry, and Shasir will take that up. Appreciate it. I'd okay. like to give you a thoughts. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, from the, to my knowledge, from the Buddhism perspective, even in, in from the Schopenhauer perspective, suffering is not a bad thing. Suffering yeah. is a good thing. Because when it's a suffering, we come, we come to the discoveries, not just discoveries of ourselves, discoveries of the world. We cannot grow and we cannot get developed without suffering. That's that's the main point. And then if, if you look further in the Schopenhauer's philosophy as well as Buddhism, suffering is, is not presented in any negative sense. Suffering is a uh, is a is a travel, basically, as Buddha said, it's better to travel well than to arrive. Therefore, while we travel, we experience suffering. In order to arrive, okay, if you don't arrive, but at least we grow. We grow and we get developed. So suffering is not a bad thing. And, uh... But is it necessary, Henry? I'm sorry, just to the point. Uh, it's all it's all relative. It's all relative. Because if you want to grow as a human being, and understand and understand this world, and most important, understand yourself. Suffering is a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. And it all depends because all, everything is relative from the human perspective in this world. Right? You can you can you can have oh it's a bad thing, and then you can stay without development. You can stay as the you are without change. Well, but it's not possible anyway. We cannot avoid suffering. Okay, I'm not a Schopenhauer, just sure I finished the point, but I think we can also progress through suffering or through positive experience. Through my, it's what I would consider, right? Like, and Shashir, sorry, go ahead and finish the point. Okay, if I can just interject here, there's two questions raised by John, and uh, Henry explains the suffering, and there's a lot of loss in translation. And I just want to bring that to the attention. I believe. When I read the text, I believe that what is conveyed is not the fact that there's extreme pessimism here. It is explaining the fact that in life, this satisfaction always is part and parcel of it, because as human nature is, we are never all and uh, never satisfied. Our wants never cease. If I've got one, I need two. If I've got two, I need five. This is something that continues. But if we didn't have that, how would we know what is happiness? How will you define happiness if you don't have suffering to compare it with? And when Henry says these are relative, everything that we convey, and I'm successful, but not as successful as him. So I'm a failure. When do we stop and say, this is total tranquility. This is happiness. Well, it's difficult to define happiness as is difficult to define unhappiness or sadness or dissatisfaction or even call it pessimism, if you wish. So I think that was my answer to that question of being negative. The second thing that you bring up, John, is, is the fact that how does, does this concept, Eastern concept or Hindu concept, convey in terms of being able to be able to say, this is a thinking man's religion. A thinking man's religion states that we don't personify somebody outside of ourselves as having domain over us, but we ourselves are the people who can find and seek ourselves. So answer lies within when we keep seeking outside. That's the tradition from the East, probably both from Hinduism and thereafter, or thereafter, very shortly thereafter, from Buddhism. The big change that happened between the two, that transition, was the fact that Buddhism pretty much chopped out the mythology side of Hinduism. The mythologies were the stories that had reinforced the point being made. And when that was taken out, it became a religion of monks. People who were now ascetic no longer and kind of contributing as much to the society as a normal society would function. This is why in India, where Hindu, where 
Buddhism originated, took over the whole nation, or that there was no nation, there was areas, took over the whole area only to revert back to Hinduism a few hundred years later because society could not carry on with everybody saying, I don't do anything, I go beg for my meal and I find my enlightenment, my nirvana. So this is a societal need that attracted back into Hinduism, which of course is far more versatile in saying that you need all kinds. It just can't be one-sided and say, I only want to pursue one side of mysticism or philosophy. I think I've spoken plenty. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think Michael had his hand up at some point. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Shishir. It was very useful. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I am. Um... It's just how I like uh, my personal kind of like a uh, uh, comments on that. I think uh, uh, whatever kind of pessimism or optimism, it's kind of like a feeling based on the, um, how I say that. Um, I think with metaphorics, kind of we try to understand the fire, but we try to understand the heat, make the heat, and analyze the heat, and try to understand the fire understand the fair i don't think it's a good approach it doesn't matter is like pessimism or like op optimism because those is based on kind of like the feeling on what we think i think basically in in the brain i think we have like maybe so what do we have what do we want so if the brain kind of like function i'm i'm not sure is the brain that work like one 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 position if they work different regions so if the brain they have like a one region working on what do we have another region they work on what we want. So I think whatever is pessimist or like optimism, they still they have the, the layer because time is created by the brain, not created by the thought. The thought is a kind of like secondary outcome from the brain. Uh, that's kind of like logic is if we really want to category all the thought like a real immaterial things, try to understand the, the, the root of cause, I think it never can, can, can reach the can reach kind of like co-hosting because the the will is come from what we think they come from the brain even the brain they work in the, the mechanism they work in that 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 function so whatever we we we, we think in a positive way or negative way we cannot um clear to clean up the the, the layers I, I think that's my uh, my comment thank you great michael henry I would like to comment on that. Sure. Uh, if I understand correctly, Michael. Okay, this is saying that uh, optimist is a pessimist equipped with the facts. Um, again, we're coming to the philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer, proving him right, because it's all our interpretation. Uh, optimism, pessimism, we can think, we can see things. Uh, at the stage of our mind, of our personal interpretation, equipped with our senses, with our state of mind, with our mood, with our personal events. For example, uh, I'm looking at a beautiful uh, landscape and I have an excellent mood as everything good in my life and I enjoy it. Tomorrow, I, use, I look at the same landscape and there's a tragedy in my life. And I look at the, at the, at the clouds, at the dark clouds, I see they're horrible, they're gloomy, they're negative, they're bad. And then, then they, they, they put me down. Well, yesterday I enjoyed that. Again, coming to the shopping hall, it's all, it's all conditional. Very good, okay. I'm having oh. a hard time, Ali, to raise my hand. I've been doing it on the video. But oh, I thought you just where... have seven high with that we didn't no. forget about you. No. We, we didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to, okay. John Cummins and after John Cummins, many. He already talking, sorry, many. <laughs> yeah, but can you show me? Okay, no, that's fine. But I'm going to ask some questions, but where's the raise a hand thing? What do you okay. do? Okay, you have to go to reactions, which is on my computer. It's on the bottom okay. of the screen on the right side. You... Yeah, I got it. 
Okay, the thanks. Action. I got it. You're, Thank you're you. You're welcome. Yeah. You can stop talking, Ella. Okay. Oh, I apologize. That's okay. Um, again, Henry, I really want to stress that this guy is not a negative philosopher. He's a positive philosopher. If you read him in the original, you'll see that clearly. Um, I, I know I said it earlier, but um, that is the case. With respect to Buddhism and Schopenheimer and Hinduism, Buddhism, from what I can see, I've been, I've been to a Buddhist temple. I was at the Cambodian Buddhist temple in um, just south of Sharon on the two weekends ago. I never seen it was the Cambodian New Year. It was Cambodian. Talk to the monk. I haven't seen such love and belonging and connection as I seen there. There was no suffering going on, John. They were happy, genuinely happy, genuinely welcoming. And Schopenheimer was too. Just uh, he shouldn't have called it will. He should have called it energy. And uh, he would have been treated a lot better. So that's all. Thank you, Buddhist. I'm not a Buddhist. I'm a Hindu and a Buddhist and an every man, Allah. You Hindu, Hindu and, and Buddhist. That's even better. Mm, Henry has any comments, or we go to Allah, many? That's a misrepresentation. I'm apologize. Um, yeah, I would like to share the my my personal story. Uh, a while ago, I uh, damaged my low back, and uh, the pain was uh, horrible, severe. So, as uh, this this bulge pressed against against this sciatic nerve, and then uh, um, so I suffered. And uh, while I was lying in bed, I had to find a good uh, posture to to uh, diminish my pain. And I came across the book. Uh, it's called uh, The Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Franklin. And I read it. I read it, what people experience in the concentration camp. And I realized that my suffering is just nothing. It's just nothing compared with what they have experienced. It's just a joke. So it was kind of spiritual transformation and realizing that everything is relative. So my suffering was a good thing. I appreciate it. Otherwise, I wouldn't come to this realization. That's just an example, Ella, to in response to what you asked before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think there are always two ways to respond to your comment through negative experience but i firmly believe you can go to the same goal through the positive experience and it's our, our interpretation negative and positive our personal interpretation we never know when it's going to turn out positive or negative it's our immediate interpretation of the current event event happens we interpret it okay this is negative this is positive based on our current state but later on, this event can, can turn out positive, but we have no clue to determine it at this time. Yeah, that's called real life. Maybe you're right, you can say that, but yeah. Okay, sure. Okay, Manny, are you still wanna talk? <laughs> Do you still wanna talk? <laughs> Sorry about it, you muted. Oh, there we go. Yeah, you, Better? you, you're the one, then Iggy and Akta Iggy Shishir, please. I have a, a hope what will be a, s a simple question. I couldn't uh, understand every word uh, that was, was said, uh, uh, but I did read all the text. And could we summarize maybe the, the two or three points that where um, Schopenhauer is considered pessimistic or negative? I mean, one of them was, of course, was the question of whether one should live or not live which is, I guess he's not the first one to question that. Shakespeare did uh, before, so. 
<laughs> so th that's one. What, what are the couple of others? I just want to get the get the idea of why is he is and anybody calling this pes pessimistic? Because I just thought he was just being realistic. So um, why is he being labeled that way? What is he saying specifically with people saying, oh my God, that's pessimistic? I can explain that from my point of view. Because Schopenhauer has described what people are afraid to admit to themselves. He, he described things that we feel one way or another at some extent, more or less, but uh, in, uh, in many situations, we are afraid. We are afraid to admit to ourselves this is the end of life and the, the we are helpless against this some unstoppable uh, unknown force. So we just find excuses for ourselves. So Schopenhauer was open and he disclosed it. And uh, the ordinary people take him as a pessimist. This is how I see it. So but he was he was really telling the truth, but people didn't want to hear the truth. So they thought it was he was negative. Yes, kind of. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Okay, thanks, I Iggy, please. Um, yeah, I'm okay. I missed the first part of the presentation, but um, is it basically what we're talking about is what truly makes someone happy? Is that the basis of all this whole discussion and uh, philosophy presented? And I have a second question. That's the first one. Uh, that's the first one I can explain. Um, Schopenhauer meant that there is no happiness per se. It doesn't exist. Happiness is a lack of pain, either physical or mental. This is how it classifies as happiness. This is uh, because we, we, cannot, we cannot define happiness without feeling something that tortures us without, without suffering. So if there is no suffering, there is no happiness because we cannot define it. Okay, so we oh. always compare. Okay, I get it. I understand. Um, uh, my second question is, John, why do you have a black and white screen? It's his negative perception of reality. <laughs> am I right, John? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about well, I thought his, I might. I thought he got his. Per I thought maybe his computer was from the nineties or something. <laughs> no, no, no. My, my computer. No, he is from the nineties, not the computer. No, I'm, I'm Sorry. from the, I'm from the, you know, like the, 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 the pre <laughs> not even the previous century, the previous century before that. The, the answer is very simple. Um, she, um, Ronan gave a couple of great presentations of, of, about Marshall McLuhan, right? Um, and uh, he. M M Marshall McLuhan, you know, obviously was mostly talking in the 60s. So most of the sort of the stills and most of the uh, the TV shows are in black and white. And I thought it looked really cool. <laughs> in, oh, okay. So in, McLuh in McLuhan's sense. Style. You know, it's a style thing. Got it. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, um, McLuhan, <laughs> Lifestyle. McLuhan had this, um, you know, had this uh, like hot media and cold media. <laughs> that Ronan okay. explained all of that. So I just. All right, you can get back to the serious discussion now. Well, no, we're going to stay on the serious discussion because I know where John's from. <laughs> he's from John the twilight. Zone. He's from he's from the twilight zone. <laughs> and Marsha McLuhan, who he just mentioned, starred in one of those episodes. And uh, John Smithen was a supporting actor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. John, it's no wonder your yellow hand doesn't work when it's black and white. Well, no, I, I just honestly, I again, this is an age thing. I just forgot where it was. <laughs> yeah, you know, we we mention our lives sometimes. Some people like black stripes and white stripes. Maybe yeah. yes. that one, John. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's an artistic decision, uh, Iggy. You, 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 basically, right. Yeah, just special attention yeah. what no, was the, needed. That's no, I, I love black and white, yeah. personally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John, probably it's your attitude towards uh, pessimism of Schopenhauer, showing black and white. Or... Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay. Do, you have a, do you have a rose colored filter anywhere? There is a rose colored filter, isn't there? But I, I, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah. Can we, okay. can, can we return to serious people? You've got two waiting in, in the line. Yes, first Shishir and after Shishir, Sherman, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Ella. John, you're looking fine. You see things in black and white. I appreciate that. Good. With that said, <laughs> I just want to talk about the will that Henry was focusing on. And quite often we get narrowed down to the will of survival as being the will that Schopenhauer is talking about. He has several different ways of interpreting real, will. One of them, of course, is that will to survive. The second one he talks about is the will to power, to rise to the top. That's also part of the human nature. And this is the part of will that Nietzsche took it and expanded on it and went to the Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. That's, that is really something that came out of Schopenhauer's will. And then it expanded into the Nietzsche's philosophy of the human need to rise above. The other thing that will was expressed and defined by Schopenhauer was in compassion, in justice, and in kindness. This is something that gets overlooked because so much of the focus goes into the pessimism that is picked up on that first part of will, will to survive. So I just thought I'd, I'd kind of give you the full equation so we can see both sides. I'm sure Henry was gonna to come to that in his next talk, but I, I kind of just wanted to make sure that that doesn't get overlooked. Thank you. That, that's great, uh, Shishers. Thank you to you. And we go to Sherman, please. Hello, Henry. So Henry, I have uh, a comment to make. I understand the impact that suffering has on a person and by suffering, a person does understand what is happiness. So I appreciate that point. But to what extent does suffering become trauma? So the person suffers so much that that person is traumatized and consequently that person's vision of the world is skewed. And not only that, but that person's vision, which is uh, the product of severe trauma, is passed on to future generations. So we have a traumatic a person who has been highly traumatized, and mm -hmm. and, and ma on many occasions their children carried that traumatic, not tragic, but traumatic view onto the world. So I'm just wondering to what extent. Uh, this is there is a certain imbalance to excessive suffering, where uh, trauma uh, will distort a person's view of the world, and that person will not be able to undertake matters in a more balanced manner. And that's just my concern with the whole issue of suffering. Um, in, the, in the next part, I will come to this, uh, but I'd like to mention that uh, Schopenhauer insists that we're all individuals. We're all individuals, so which means what? Um, second, um, like the head of Schopenhauer indicates that people cannot escape from the clutches of the will. Will brings suffering. It could be, it could be expressed by different ways, mental, physical, whatever. So um, according to his philosophy, we are doomed, unless, unless there is a way to escape, but it's gonna be in a part two. Um, but majority of human beings have no means to escape using the, the, the intellectual abilities. Into the, in, the intellect is a slave of the will. So in this case, um, trauma, suffering, and is an action of the will, according to Schopenhauer. And sometimes it can result in suicide, which is, again, the result of the will, which he calls a demonic force. 
this is how this is according to his philosophy. Okay, that's fine. It's just that, uh, well, here, I, I looked into Schopenhauer's uh, life. And so uh, when, before he died, in his will, he willed all his money to uh, Prussian soldiers who participated in the repression of the 1848 revolution. And so I guess you can uh, classify Schopenhauer as a reactionary, I don't know. But uh, for those who fought in the 1848 revolution and what they were fighting for was greater liberty and freedom, uh, Schopenhauer seemed to have a problem with that. And so the money, his money went to, I believe, the families of, of those soldiers who died putting down the revolt. So I just, again, I'm thinking, eventually a person has to escape this trauma in order to deal with the world more effectively. And I guess you can say that all of history is really a history of trauma and is carried on from one generation to the next. You only have to think about how one nationality looks upon another nationality and where for succeeding generations, there's this undying distrust. But uh, nowadays there's various therapies and so on that are used to overcome trauma. And people can perhaps uh, see more clearly and act more effectively. Anyway, that's my thoughts, Henry, but thank you for your presentation. Uh, you're welcome. And then I believe he summarized, he, he summarized up his answer and then the particular uh, slide indicating homo homini lupus. So unfortunately, this is- Well, that's, I think that referred to a uh, play a lupus, but anyway, no, well, not mind that. But anyways, thank you, Henry. Mm -hmm. Chairman, if I can just add to what you yeah. mentioned about him leaving his money at the end of his life to a charity which was helping wounded soldiers. That's, that's right. What I, that's what I had read. It wasn't meant for any one party or the other. It was meant to help wounded soldiers. So he was showing compassion there. He was showing regard for the fellow human beings. In answer to the fact that what happened to generational trauma, it's, it's very difficult because if you are going to be all individuals, how are you going to look out for each other and be supportive? This is why Buddhism and Hinduism tend to go into the Sanghas. Sanghas are group gatherings where they support each other. And of course, we all know how group support is so crucial in uh, even therapeutics of psychology and, and psychiatry. So yeah, it is very similar to that. I see, but just one point, um, at least the reference that I looked at, I think it was Stanford University uh, of philosophy. I believe it did state that he left the money to, it was a charity and just as you stated, but it was for, the families of those soldiers who put down the revolt. Now, uh, that's why I brought it forward because again, it's, uh, okay, well, I'll just leave it like that. That's a matter to have, that's a historical fact that has to be clarified. And remember him, he, he's the guy who slept with a gun in the bed. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> that might be, uh, uh, problematic and it might be a it might just be, uh, See, there's no mention of his father. He, uh, there's a, apparently there's a traumatic a break with his mother. His so father what, committed suicide. Well, you know, it's, it's hard to play uh, armchair 21st century psychiatrist on past figures, but you have to wonder what impact the suicide of his father, uh, his sudden break with his mother, has left uh, what impact that has, that has had. And given modern studies in psychiatry and psych psychology, uh, these are factors that have led to uh, traumatic behavior, oftentimes abusive behavior by people. I'll leave it at that. Okay, excellent comments. And thank you, Sharman. Thank you, Shishir. John Smithin. You can, you have a floor. Um, 
Yeah, yes, I do. I, I actually learned how to do the yellow hand reaction, unlike uh, Mr. Cummins. So oh, um, congratulations on that. One up on you, uh, JC. Um, but I'll defer to many first, because many has a question. Um, no, just a comment. But please finish, John. I can wait. Oh, no, no. It, it, it's quite long and complicated. I think you should, I think you should go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, so now I have to remember what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> you have so, to make it easy and uh, yeah. simple. <laughs> Yeah, so certainly uh, having such a trauma like having a father commit suicide will make one think very much about a lot of things, right? It's uh, a lot of the times trauma in a, in, a, in a figure's life or in a writer's life is the impetus or suffering is the impetus to uh, think a lot and try to understand the world. And then, then we have a lot of writings and and we reflect on them, which, which is also great. Also, as far as trauma is concerned, as you were saying, it's generational. I mean, that's just one example of suffering. Suffering is just not, not a word. It's not an intellectual word. It's something people experience and it's painful. It's, it has real results. It has real, real results on generations. It, it, it you know, it's and and it's a fact. And that's I think what probably what Schopenhauer is talking about suffering, right? It's it, suffering. is not academic. Suffering is very real, right? And we all we may all uh, I may be very good at intellectualizing it, right? And that's really what it's about. You can intellectualize it, and you can say, oh, it teaches you, or without suffering, you know. But you know what? It's pain in the neck. I'd rather do without it. Thank you. Schopenhauer okay. said that the suffering is very personal. And yeah. uh, what, what is suffering for one individual cannot be suffering at all for another. So yeah. it's, it's a personal interpretation of things. Yeah. So yeah, suffering is a philosophical point, as I understand by itself. Yes. Maybe that could be one of the discussion, but not the, like maybe someone can pursue on that. So we have two Johns now, and again, Smith and you go. You want to go ahead, or you want to? No, I'll go to thirty John as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then. Okay, I'll take it. And John Cummins, you you can put your um, um Are you playing with a with a hand, or you really want to talk, John? Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's no, all right. no, it's the first time. That's the first time an Englishman. <laughs> that's the first time an Englishman let an Irishman go first. You're going to regret it. Uh, it's, um, it's not the first time, John, and I regret it in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Yeah. Uh, anyway, congratulations on raising the hand, John Cummins. You did really, <laughs> I see the big progress. At least, I, I know at least you learned something from this presentation, that's for sure. John, uh, John uh, texted me how to do it, and then he did a YouTube video showing me how to do it, and then I figured it out. <laughs> Thanks, John. Um, Schopenheimer and suffering. So his dad committed suicide. His mom didn't like him. He didn't like his mom. I'm not sure. So this is a guy that was, had to deal with suffering. And then he writes these books considered by many, the best philosophical works in Plato. And we're not going to admire him. Like I see it. So this pessimism stuff is unwarranted towards him read his books and you will not finish saying that he's a pessimist in my opinion if you read it right especially if you read will as energy it was the labeling this will that kind of really set him back because he, he didn't mean will with intention didn't mean will good and evil he like he, like he was like shakespeare there is no such thing as good and evil is thinking that make it so. And he did what the Buddhists say. They don't say that life is suffering, that you will suffer. But if you think properly, rationally, you can overcome it and be better for it. That happiness is to be found within, not without. Schopenhauer understood this and seen it as the truth. And he tried to create a philosophical system, a complete one, to show us that. I think he needs to be reevaluated because it's it's kind of a cartoon ish um, outlook we have towards him, and I really believe it's mistaken. And I congratulate you, Henry, for finding him 
and appreciating him because he should be. As the speech is over. Thank you, John, for finding us. We also appreciate it. Uh, any, any comments, Henry, on this? Uh, well, I would like to say that sometimes, sometimes, well, actually quite often, we label, we label things, we label people based on a very uh, limited amount of information. So we create, we make opinions based on our uh, impression, which very, 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 very limited impression, of not, not based on facts, but something we know, and then and we just say, okay, here is what it is. I, I, I would, I wouldn't rush with the opinion. I wouldn't rush with the label. So as uh, John has said, you got to know more and uh, understand and understand what's going on. Yeah, further to that, Henry, like one of my other favorite philosophers, Kierkegaard, you know, the mob is untruth. But what he did say, to label me is to negate me. And I don't think there's any other philosopher that's been labeled more than Schopenheimer. Yeah. Labeling turns you into an object, not a subject. We all do it all the time, constantly. Buddhism tries to teach you and Hinduism tries to teach you not to do that very thing. Um, sorry for the speech. Yes, I totally agree. John, you still have your hand raised. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll go ahead now. It's, it's, it's related to what John was talking about and I take John's point about labeling. Um, you know, how do we know um, whether, um, what's his name, Schopenhauer was pessimistic or optimistic? Because um, uh, we're not basically in his head, are we, right? You know, like in his own personal thing. But, but, um, but uh, a more general point is this. We've been talking about sort of more about psychology, haven't we? Um, you know, did what was his relationship with his father, you know, what happened to him, you know, to, in, in life to, to affect him. What we don't seem to have done is we don't seem to have um, looked at the actual philosophy, like the tradition of ideas that, that he was part of and in the middle of. And I think it's very important to recognize that he was, of course, uh, you know, right in the middle of German idealism. Uh, um, you, you know, we, we had, um, obviously in the previous century, there had been uh, uh, Hegel, um, there had been, um, uh, uh, well, now Hegel was in that century, there was Kant, obviously, right? Um, you know, then obviously he was extremely yeah. influential later on. Nietzsche, he influenced Nietzsche, influenced others later on. He was very influential in, in the 19th century. Um, and some part of his attitude then might be a consequence of precisely being in that philosophical tradition. And to understand what that philosophical tradition is, I think we have to um, see what the opposite uh, philosophical tradition is. So the opposite philosophical tradition to idealism would not be materialism. Uh, we've been had that discussion before. It would be something like metaphysical realism. And, uh, you know, and to an extent, uh, Aristotle, Aquinas, Gilson, Searle, we, we know the people that have, uh, that have commented. Okay, well, um, Rasmussen and Delor made, made two points about, quote, metaphysical realism. They say, well, metaphysical realism has actually two aspects. It has a, an epistemological aspect, um, you know, reality itself. It asserts the existence of, uh, you know, uh, like a physical reality. Tori um, discussed, uh, Tori in his last talk uh, insisted on the existence of also a, um, what would you call it, Tori, a sociological reality as well, right? Which is just as real, you know, even if not material. Right? A, social, a social reality. Yeah, or yeah, social yeah. So, so reality in both sense. But there's also, Rasmussen and Denor have argued, there's also to metaphysical realism 
um, like an epistemological aspect, namely that knowledge in some sense is attainable. Right, we're not talking about critical realism, you know, what the, the chairman talked about, we're talking about, you know, metaphysical realism, that it, it's possible to acquire knowledge in some sense, right? Uh, whatever, it, it may be a difficult job, you know, you may have, have to work long and hard, scientists work forever and so forth. But ultimately, we can acquire knowledge in, 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 in some sense. Well, of course, idealism questions both of those you know, it, it questions whether there exists a, an objective reality, but also think of Kant and, you know, uh, that, that whole tradition. It questions whether the thing in itself is at all knowable. You know, we can't actually know, quote, you know, the thing, the thing in itself. And that's relevant to the, the that's relevant, I think, to the position that sort of later philosophers take. It's relevant to the position that existentialism, somebody mentioned Kierkegaard, it's relevant to the position that existentialists take, definitely relevant to, um, you know, Sartre, for example, um, 100 years after Schopenhauer, um, being a nothingness. Because one assumes that the world is not understandable, because it all doesn't make sense, because it all seems meaningless, right, you get Sartre's nausea, you know, uh, you know, Sartre's panic. And the idealist response to that is, well, you have to kind of create yourself, <laughs> you know, by an act of will. You have to give meaning, you know, to your own life, the typical existentialist notion. Whereas a metaphysical, um, you know, a metaphysical realist would have other resources. Uh, you know, you could follow the sort of Aquinas path, if you like, um, uh, and acquire knowledge that way. Anyway, that, so what I'm trying to do is instead of trying to interpret Schopenhauer or anyone um, essentially from uh, like a psychological perspective with his father kind to him or whatever, right? What about placing him in the tradition of thought that he was in? And does that tradition of thought have resources, uh, you know, to, um, to make you an optimist or a pessimist? You see the point I'm making? I'd be interested in what people have to say about that. Okay, Henry, do you have comments or we go to the next uh, member? I have, a, I have a comment to what John has said. Uh, yes, go ahead. Um, uh, the interpretation of uh, the meaning of this world or the meaning of life, uh, if you wish. Um, Schopenhauer means that it's not that it doesn't exist in my understanding, but we are not able to comprehend it. This is the point. We are limited and then, well, we, we create the, 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 the meaning of life for ourselves because we have no choice. Otherwise it would be total despair, boredom and, 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 and anxiety. But uh, this is what he means, basically. We are limited, we, we, we can't, we can't, uh, comprehend it. Yeah. Well, that's what I said. Idealism does have, uh, an, a, as well as a metaphysical aspect, an epistemological yeah. aspect, as does realism. And the question I'm asking is, you know, possibly to a possibly a realist philosopher would have more intellectual resources, if you want to put it that way, um, you know, to explain uh, the human condition or whatever. Um, Sherman's next, I guess. And I thought. I thought I was next. Well, I'm sorry, you. John. You're not, but uh, if you really want to, I don't know. I'll I'll be short. Yeah. Okay. Schopenheimer wasn't an idealist, and he wasn't a realist. We've talked about this many times, John. He was intangible. He believed that light emerged through energy and light, the Big Bang. That is not an idealist might be closer to a realist but to me he was intangibly that if you have a circle that's idealist a circle that's realist and it's a venn diagram he's he's the part that two circles in in um, um fit into the, the venn part that's all great comment and okay john want to re reply or we go to sherman 
Yeah, well, there's a, th there's a third thing, right, uh, which is materialism. Right, like the, the the fight isn't between idealism and uh, uh, materialism, which is um, the way it's interpreted. It, it's it's the it's the it's a, it's a dispute between idealism and realism, and realism realism cannot be reduced to uh, um, materialism. You know, materialism. That that's the point. It, yeah, but John it, trying it, to it, it, including energy. Right? Yeah, but John trying to say that intangible reality it's kind of connection between realism and idealism it's kind of on the edge of both they kind of connect each other and it's interesting point really philosophical maybe we can think about it because yeah, i don't have the say, answer we have to pursue that, that it's a good 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 yeah interesting idea we have to think about it and finally i'm very sorry Sherman, for the waiting time <laughs> but now it, your, your time all right thank you so a couple of weeks ago, I read a very interesting book. It's written by R.J. Snell, Through a, dark, uh, Through a Glass Darkly. Bernard Lonergan and Richard Rorty, Knowing Without a God's Eye View. So in other words, how do we know what is true if we are not God? And well, just referring to Schopenhauer, if I remember correctly in Henry's presentation, Knowledge or understanding the world is just derived through uh, our senses, through the eyes, through looking, through seeing. And whether you look at Richard Rorty or Bernard Larnigan, they both critique that view. They say that that actually has led to uh, incorrect views of the world since, because we assume that just by looking, we know. Both of these philosophers disagree with that point. Now, uh, Lonergan goes one step further, and he does say that we could know, but you have to go beyond just looking. So looking or seeing does not provide us with knowledge. But if we work within that framework, and this is what John was saying, this is the intellectual milieu at that time uh, with David Hume, uh, well, the world is relative. <clears throat> the world will never be known. It will never be understood. So true critical realism, uh, it is possible to attain knowledge and substantiated knowledge based upon uh, a critical view of the world, not simply upon if I see it, then I, it must be true. So I think that part of whether Part of the understanding we have is Schopenhauer and his view is that his epistemology is based upon looking. If I look, then I know, then therefore whatever I see must be reality. Uh, Rorty would disagree with that. And Lonergan also disagrees with that point, but Lonergan goes one step further to provide a means by which we could substantiate a body of knowledge so that it is it workable until uh, the next body of knowledge comes about. So just to complement John's point, uh, I think the problem is that Schopenhauer's epistemology is really an materialist epistemology, which then leads to a distortion of the world. No wonder. What, what, was, that, what was that book, um, Sherman? It's written by R.J. Snell, isn't that the one you mentioned, Tori? No. No. No, no Tori, Tori, uh, yeah, okay. No, to, a, yeah. to a glass darkly, and it's a comparison of Lonergan and Rorty. Okay, yeah, good. And it's very good. Uh, they both critique, uh, actually, they both agree with Aristotle. They, uh, uh, this author does mention Gilson, uh, yeah. but uh, at the same time, uh, okay, both Lonergan and Rorty agree that looking as a form of understanding is in inadequate, but Rorty would go on and say that we can never really attain that knowledge. All that we can attain is perhaps what is considered a, a consensual view of the a contemporary community. While uh, Lonergan would say that, uh, it is possible to actually move beyond that particular view. 
where we have substantiating knowledge. And I don't know, there's, there is this Italian uh, physicist, Carlo Rovelli. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't help think after reading a number of his books that uh, he in many ways as a uh, quantum physicist is also a critical realist. But that's a different topic. Yeah. That's another presentation. Maybe you can have a lead on that, Charman. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a little bit too many quirks and quirks for me. Yeah. Oh. That's a joke for quantum physics. Yeah. The quirks and quarks. Mm -hmm. All right, because we're always open to the presentations. You know that. Yep. Okay. Any comments from Henry? Uh, no. 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 We just take it and as is and go to the next member, Tori, please. Yeah, so this. Uh, Thank you, Sherman. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. This is a, a very tricky uh, area, metaphysical, phys metaphysical realism to to discuss, or at least in the last five minutes that we have. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that, but um, and I'm not that um, I don't have all the answers, that's for sure. So um, what I would say to begin with is um, reality is what persists, whether despite what we think of it. Reality is what is real, despite whether there are humans to perceive to perceive the reality and to communicate with other people about their personal individual experience of reality so reality is is something that exists whether they're humans or not and you know our concern about epistemology so that that's kind of an ontology that's there whether we whether we exist or not and and uh our epistemology epistemology comes from the greek word episteme which means the knowledge of reality and so, so the question that the the western tradition since descartes has been dealing or you could go back to the medieval philosophers of the, thomas aquinas and uh, will ockham uh, will willem ockham william of ockham and so on and so forth is how do you have knowledge which is a mind thing versus of reality which exists whether we are being mindful of the reality reality or not so even within metaphysics, and and what Descartes' breakthrough was is to, and what a lot of the idealism versus materialist, uh, di, uh, you know, dichotomy comes down to whether you know you're a scientist who believes totally materialist, or you're you know a Platonic idealist that only ideas are real. Um, Yes, that is a that that dualism is kind of what Descartes took to the absolute extreme by saying there's actually two different realms of reality. There's the mind realm, and then there's the physical realm. So he 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 was just a, a pure dualistic two worlds. But we we know that that's not true. It's oh, there's only one world. There's only you know, and um, and so in a sense we have to one of my favorite quotes of Charles Sanders Pierce is, you know, we, we have to be materialist without flinching, which, which gets down to, I I've just been reading a, a recent book. Um, this is it right here called philosophy. Oh, that's, that's the one. Yeah. 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 Philosophy yeah. in the flesh. I'll try to get it focused here. It's not focusing, but anyways, by um, Cognitive scientists, uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, and I'm familiar with them. They they wrote a book about 30, 40 years, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, called Metaphors We Live By. I won't get into all that, but um, the fact is that we're, you know, there's, even within metaphysical realism, the question is, how do you come up with, um, the, the there's still a sneaking duality in understanding of, of taking the metaphysical realist stance. I mean, Rorty is one, 
uh, Lonergan is one, Charles Taylor, uh, you know, Searle is one, the ordinary language philosophers are, you know, Wittgenstein are, are these metaphysical realists, but there's, there's different flavors of those, that, that, that uh, school of philosophy, if you will. And you, one of the key things is, how does the mind, I mean, after all, we are all talking with language, you know, uh, Schopenhauer was writing down things. This philosophy is sort of a love of knowledge, right? And it's it's these meaningful statements about what is real and how do we understand the process of our mind and our intellect to know reality. Knowledge of reality is is not the reality. It is just our knowledge of it. So it's it's this created symbolic representation of real. And then we get in more complicated things like money and governments and marriages and these social objects that are created in language and then referred to as if they have a physical ontology, or at least there's a there's a real ontology to them. You are you are certainly a married person, you know, despite if you have affairs on the side or something. But so um you know, uh, the question is, how do you, it's, it's really those representations, how, how closely they, they um, match reality. That's the issue. And we, we, we get caught up in this, um, this, this sort of dichotomy of dualism. There's, you know, and anyways, it's, I'll say, I'll leave it there, but I haven't quite made my point, but it's even metaphysical realism is, is not a um there there's it's a very tricky realm to get to be totally metaphysically real and one of the things in this book they're talking about is an an embodied realism which really takes some of the cognitive psychology cognitive psychology how how the mind how the brain actually processes and and creates knowledge and um, one of the key points is that it's very metaphorical. Our knowledge is very metaphorical. But um, so it, it's a very tricky place. And there's even metaphysical realists who are still caught in a, a um, you know, sort of a ridiculous Cartesian dichotomy of idealism and material realism. Um, may I quickly uh, comment on that? Absolutely, Henry. Okay. Um, Emmanuel Kant was very specific in this respect. He said he called things in themselves. We cannot comprehend with our abilities, given abilities, senses, and and and, and, and etc. So things in themselves are not able to comprehend. Period. Uh, this, in terms of uh, metaphysics, the philosophy, what philosophy, what does philosophy do? Philosophy combines what is common for humans and comes up with ideas based on our knowledge. This is what we call knowledge. This is what we think is our knowledge. Uh, it's different from metaphysics. Metaphysics and philosophy can explain. That's the advantage. Metaphysics cannot explain. They come from within, with no explanation. Because metaphysics does not, does not give you the knowledge if, in the human sense. So this is- Kind this of like axioms, maybe that's what you're trying to say? Like axioms, we have to base our- Axiom, according to Schopenhauer, according to Kant, Schopenhauer built his platform on Kant's, on Kant's philosophy. He indicated that as well that we cannot comprehend uh, the knowledge. We use that we call it. Uh, he called it representation. This is how we how we think we know. This is how we interpret things. But in order to understand and obtain the knowledge, it's going to be part two. He said we have to come up with a way of metaphysics within from our body mm -hmm. but this is part two again i haven't come to this point because it was short yeah we're looking forward to that one so who's relevant to this comment 
Tore, did you finish or you want to still say something? Well, I would just say that the, the, the Kant's idea of a thing in itself is, as, for example, Cyril will say, is a, a meaningless concept. There are no things in themselves. Every time we say there's some thing, yes, we don't know everything about it, but we it's always a perspective. The epistemology we have is the perspective on the on the thing. The knowledge we have is the perspective on the thing. There is no thing in itself as if you know it's outside of our we we the thing in it, the thing in itself is a concept that's sort of self-contradictory because already we've said there is a thing. It's it's a it's a function of our of our mind saying that there's a thing, but we don't can't comprehend what that thing is by saying it's 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 something beyond our comprehension. It's in other words, this this is um this this is the tricky divide between the metaphysical or philo philosophical approach and then like we were talking before and john brought up this sort of the psychological approach you know and, and by the way psych psychology just means sort of the the logic of the soul or the speech of the soul and in a way it's very tied to our epistemological view of reality it's uh but it, it's that you know from the philosophical standpoint we're trying to we're trying to be objective and that's the other side of it objectivity is it takes on different meanings whether if you are an idealist or a materialist or you are purely a, a non-dichotomized thinker and one of the things is all of our knowledge there, there's no such thing as absolutely objective knowledge because it will always evolve and get better Kuhn's scientific revolutions for example or just thinking about the Newtonian view versus the uh, relativity view of physics, quantum physics. Um, so there, there's always no final place for for knowledge, and every every all our knowledge is just a belief. You know, knowledge is belief. It's not you know absolute certainty. Um, so it's really the question is as we try to find either philosophical certainty or metaphysical certainty or um you know the truth of some domain of science um we're always finding just beliefs you know the most valid beliefs you can have that's kind of the objectivity that's possible okay i've said enough about that Okay, thank you for that. I think we go, Shenry, Sherman, is it relevant to what we are talking about, your comment? Well, in a sense, I want to address one point that Tori made okay, uh, go ahead. about this idea of dualism. And the point would be that if we're still caught up in this dualistic understanding of the world, uh, Lonergan, Schnell, and perhaps Rorty would say that we're still caught up with this epistemological approach where we assume that just by looking, just through our senses, we understand the world. And uh, if we move beyond just looking, assuming that's what leads to understanding, then uh, we will have a more adequate picture. And I agree with what Tori stated too, that uh, we have a view of the world that or, and at least from the scientific point of view, that seems to work best. So with quantum physics at this point in time, seems to work best as a way of understanding the world and also uh, uh, engineering the world. But um, anyways, that's what all I wanted to say. Oh, and then if you read Lonergan's book, Insight, he gives you a full structure of the human mind. And and another point is that in many ways, what Tori was stating in his book by Lakoff is that uh, Lonigan himself understands that uh, the mind and the body are part of one. He doesn't see the world in a dualistic way. He sees yeah. the mind and the body working together. And his point is that sometimes the body can lead to distortion, to bias, and uh, a poor understanding of the world. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's excellent. And 
we still have John Cummins who kind of want to say something and you John yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief Ella mm -hmm. again I think there's a massive misunderstanding on how on what how Schopenheimer understood will and as as we moderns understand will will is commonly understood as it involves thinking and it involves action and it involves values schopenheimer seen will as one thing and 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 it didn't have any, it was just energy it does it but it did have energy does have action but it doesn't have values that's all he's seen it as now he would have said it was a destructive force well you know heat is destructive it does kill but it also creates maybe Schopenhauer didn't talk enough about the creation side of energy. Mm -hmm. Look, refer to the quotes that Rob has put in the chat. That's the Schopenheimer I know. And he has hundreds of such quotes if you read him. <laughs> and if you read that, there's nothing that you can object to, the quotes that Rob put in there. So I think we're really missing the point here about some of us are missing the point on who and what Schopenheimer was and what he represented. Finish my speech. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's excellent. Any comments, Henry? Uh, I agree with John. And then, uh, yes, as, as the first part, it the first part presents a kind of pessimistic view, but uh, the creation of the creation part of the will is obvious as well, because even even if uh, the life of uh, individual being results in death, the death is the beginning of creation because of creation of something new. It's, it's a constant process. And uh, well, again, I'll come to this in part two, but uh, I agree with John. Uh, will, will is not just an unstoppable demonic force, it's also creation and it's well, uh, um, most, most human beings cannot cannot overcome its power. Um, Ella, I think there's just one more question from many, and then we're sort of getting to the end of time. Uh, it, be, because uh, John and Henry were uh, uh, talking about the will, and, and John, you were saying that maybe it was uh, energy. I'm really curious, uh, language-wise, he wrote in German, what is that a direct translation of, of uh, from German to English will, or is there more to it than when he said will in German, what is it, does it, does it translate to will in English? Do we know? Are you asking me, John? Cummins, yeah, I, I'm me? asking anybody who knows, John, you well, perhaps. The only way that I know this, I mean, I've read very little of Schopenheimer, but the bit I've read, First of all, he's a clear, like German writers are usually really hard, like Hegel and stuff. It's almost impossible to read it and understand it and can't. But Hegel, not mean uh, uh, Schopenheimer, like Marx and like uh, Freud, were unbelievably good writers. There's this complete enjoyment to read them. It's, they're easy to read and easy to understand. When I see that, those are people that don't have muddled thinking. They're thinking clearly, and therefore they can write clearly. Now, as far as this will and energy, I just refer to people that I refer to uh, in these matters. I have one individual, um, Brian McGee, B-R-Y-A-N McGee, a fabulous writer himself, kind of like a journalist philosopher, go on YouTube, see his stuff, see his stuff on Schopenheimer. Also in our times, uh, Melvin Bragg, go to his talk on Schopenheimer. They're bringing in academics, experts from the field. And what they say is not representative of, I feel, the majority of uh, the people here tonight that see Schopenheimer as some kind of bad guy or something. He, he's anything but. 
speech is over. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think you closed our floor for this uh, excellent philosophical presentation and discussion. And thanks to you, Henry, and thank you for all the members who did put input, who were active and who were silent. It's still like kind of we feel your energy. And it, I, I did enjoy fully this discussion. And like, I think fortunately we have a second part. <laughs> I want to say unfortunately, but I probably fought fortunately. And thank you to you personally, Henry. It's provocative, it's philosophical, and we're looking forward to the second part. Thank you for be, being here. And uh, next month, our speaker is going to be Emilia Lees. And the topic is Think Like a Vegan.